welcome to the uh, Anthropology After Data Management um, uh, Roundtable. Uh, I'd like to thank um, the um, uh, Roundtable speakers, uh, John Wilinski, uh, Beata Inland, and Kim Porton for coming, some of them coming from uh, far away. Uh, at the EASA Executive, uh, Executive Committee, we thought um, it was important to organize a conference on data, uh, data archiving, uh, uh, data management plans, um, and on the whole, uh, a new data mandate on the part of uh, research councils and university administrators. Uh, because of the types of challenges it presents to the uh, social sciences and anthropology in particular. Um, now, the, the way I thought, um, uh, the, the kind of conversation I thought it was open, uh, important to open up was not just a um, uh, a conversation that addressed the specific challenges that our anthropology might face vis-a-vis -vis, um, the new policy directives um, uh, and new funding uh, requisites. Uh, how, how do we react to those things? But uh, a broader conversation about uh, the kind of um, research and intellectual practice that anthropology is today uh, in a world where data is all around us and, uh, and digital and archival practices uh, in data management are uh, happening whether we do them ourselves or not. So, and very briefly to set the stage, to open up the, um, the, the um, to frame the conversation, I, I thought I'd go through some dates and some examples of, of digital anthropological archives. I don't, by any means, I'm not going to go through, you know, mine is not going to be a comprehensive survey of how anthropology has been doing archiving and digital archiving uh, um, in, in, in the past. I just want to use some of these, um, which are very selective, um, to, to point and, um, and, and open up, to point to and open up some questions. So let me start by going back to 1998. In uh, 1998, uh, the Higher Education Funding Council in the UK funded uh, the University of Kent's unit of anthropology and computing to run a series of experiments called Experience Reach, Experience Reach Anthropology, the ERA, uh, which were all about digitally archiving anthropological products. Now, one of the outcomes of this, for instance, was uh, the migration, the probably the first migration of uh, an ethnographic archive, Paul Sterling's Turkish village fieldwork notes to the uh, internet. Well, that was one of the outcomes of it. Uh, another outcome was uh, Stephen uh, Lyon's uh, doctoral fieldwork. Whilst he was doing doctoral fieldwork, he uh, addressed the challenge of what would it mean for him, for his ethnographic practice during fieldwork, to go online. Right? Uh, uh, what would it mean for him to produce the kinds of field notes that could um, you know, that could be published um, uh, synchronously to, you know, to the field where he was doing, etc. Um, now, Lyon, uh, Stephen Lyon, who's today a professor of anthropology at Durham University, he went on uh, his, this experience, um, um, led him later on to develop actual software for anthropological archiving, coding uh, uh, practices, for instance, software for coding, uh, kinship relationships, uh, etc. Um, uh, around this time, 1998, Johannes Fabian uh, decided to open up a website which he called the Language and Popular Culture in Africa database, uh, where he started uploading, uh, he ran a journal from that website, and he started uploading transcripts of uh, ethnographic material, transcripts of interviews, uh, um, uh, of, of ritual observations, etc and starting in parallel to uploading the material, uh, starting experimenting with what he would later call ethnographic commentary. He already, by then, in the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, anticipated that playing with these still, at the time, kind of rudimentary archival technologies um, uh, entailed a transformation uh, if not sort of a major overhaul of uh, the genre of ethnographic recording and knowledge keeping and, and ethnographic sharing. So perhaps it's not uh, um, surprising that just about that time, 
in her book, Property, Substance, and Effect, Marilyn Strathern asked a question uh, which has been at the center of the discipline probably ever since, which is what is an ethnographic effect? You know, how do we control and make visible what ethnography as a relational but also as an epistemic practice is all about? Right. So, and actually, um, although in passing, Strathern in, in the chapter in the book, in Property, Substance, Effect, when she raises this question, she hints at the internet as a space, a relational space, that suddenly destabilizes the notion of an ethnographic effect as something that is totally in control of the field work and in his, his or her migration from the field scene, from the field site to the desk. Right? So, you know, ni late 1990s, all these questions about, you know, how do we do ethnography uh, in the age of the internet, what possibilities are opened up, what is an ethnographic effect, and so on. Now, this is the book, Ethnography as Commentary, that in 2008, Johannes Fabian published, sort of summarizing his reflections about the, uh, the challenges and transformations that um, uh, the virtual archive brought to the, uh, to the discipline. Now, move forward a couple of years, 2002, um, a number of scholars and institutions signed the Budapest Declaration on Open Access. As it turns out, there's one of the leading signatories of that declaration was an anthropologist, uh, Leslie Chan. Uh, and I'll come back to Chan later. But also around that time, uh, 2005, uh, the AAA uh, decided to uh, um, task a group of people with uh, thinking what the um, a digital archiving did to archiving practices in, in, in anthropology. So anthropology has a long history of, uh, 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 of archiving in museums, uh, in personal collections, um, but the object, the physical object of the archive undergoes serious material, epistemic, uh, and, and social transformations when it moves to a, you know, when it comes a digital object, right? So that task force, which is the, uh, the um, uh, became the registry of anthropological wiki, and actually the registry itself built on the work of um, of the Council for the Preservation of Anthropological Records, which Seidel Silverman set up in 1995, right? So my point being here, it's simply being that you know there is a very long history of reflections. Um, um, uh, you know, thinking through the challenges that uh, archives present to uh, the organization of anthropological knowledge, and, and also uh, uh, when, that ob when those objects undergo um, uh, material and epistemic transformation by becoming uh, digital things. Now, 2005, 2006, still, you know, around those dates, then a PhD student, Kimberly Christen, uh, um, working with uh, indigenous Aboriginal people in Australia, decides to design a uh, digital archive that will allow for the curation, uh, preservation, but also, crucially, the negotiation around ethical protocols of access to indigenous ritual knowledge. Um, so she sits down with her informants and imagines what would it take to build a digital archive where indigenous people themselves decide the ritual protocols for accessing, clearing, licensing uh, um, uh, indigenous ritual knowledge, images, songs, uh, designs, uh, patterns, and so on. Uh, over time, uh, Kimberly Christian's work led to the um, uh, to the creation of um, Kurtu, uh, which is a software um, uh, application, uh, uh, an open source software a platform uh, designed specifically for the needs of um, uh, indigenous communities. Um, uh, that's just one of the uh, platforms that Kim Kimberly and I, her group have, have developed. So we had the first sort of 1998, 2000, where you know, Anthropologists start experimenting with the internet, and the question of what an ethnographic effect is sort of uh, started surfacing. Uh, 2002, 2006, when not only they anthropologists take materials to the to the net, uh, but actually start thinking about the net 
as an infrastructure of anthropological practice, you know, as a field site itself and the challenges that it uh, opens up. And in that context, the question I would say that uh, uh, is, is brought to the fore is what kind of archive is a social relation? You know, so I note the uh, kind of slight displacement from what kind of social relation, that kind of, what kind of social object an archive is, which well, that would be through the late 1990s, um, uh, question to actually not shine now in the mid 2000s, not shine away from the fact that all social relationships are archival, material, and infrastructural in nature, and we need to bring those uh, aspects to the fore and think about them seriously, um, uh, straight, you know, straight on. Uh, these are, in fact, questions, for instance. Uh, that were further pursued by people like Helen Varan, also working with um, uh, indigenous um, uh, Aboriginal people in Australia, or even Elizabeth Povinelli in the late, um, uh, you know, 2009, 2010. Um, now, let me come back. I know I mentioned that in the year 2002, Leslie Chan signed the Budapest uh, Declaration. It was one of the leading signatories of the Budapest Declaration uh, of Open Access. Well, Leslie Chan, you know, signed the declaration. Um, he, you know, he, it wasn't the only thing he did. Over the 2000s, um, he uh, um, addressed the challenges that uh, digital archiving um, presented not as, a, uh, as an archival practice, but as an anthropological practice. And, uh, and you know, quickly came to the realization that what was really, one of the things that was really at stake was redesigning the anthropological project as a collaborative infrastructural uh, um, uh, enterprise. So one of the things he did, um, he set up the um, Open Science Collaborative Infrastructure Project, um, which is, you've got a, a screenshot of, of the website here, um, which uh, uh, is funding um, field work in with about uh, um, uh, the building of uh, data repositories uh, with indigenous people, local communities, uh, uh, activists, etc. And I'd like to, in you know, in this line of work, include, for example, the work that um, uh, uh, one of our uh, speakers, Kim Fortin, has been doing for many years now, the Asthma Files, or more recently, the Platform uh, for Experimental, Experimental Collaborative Ethnography. So, uh, just to bring my introduction to a close, I think, you know, by, by offering sort of a very quick, um, uh, very selective uh, uh, overview of what Anthropology has been doing uh, many anthropo and this is just uh, you know a, a sample. Anthropology has been doing. Uh, anthropology has been thinking about rethinking, designing, redesigning the nature of their own um, uh, social, ethnographic, and epistemic practices with other people through infrastructures, through archives over the last 20 years. I'd like to open up a, a series of questions, which lead us to think um, not to, or, or to ask ourselves not just how we produce data, right? whether the, the nature of ethnography or anthropology is, you know, is about producing data or not producing data, whether when we get the mandate from others, say policymakers or university administrators, to turn our knowledge into data. So I'd like to shift focus, shift attention from those questions, um, uh, you know, and uh, also shift away from ideas that you know, we're being compelled to upload our data or our knowledge into other people's archives. You know? So this idea that the archive is something external to the discipline, something that others have been designing for us, etc. So these ideas that data is, is another, and then the archive is another, and that access is another, right? You know, the, the regulations, the protocols, the requirements about access are, are another thing, another thing that we have to relate to. to, um, to shift focus from those ideas to actually um, uh, bring to the fore that data, archiving, and access are integrally embedded in the everyday practice of anthropological, um, uh, of, 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 you know, of an anthropological practice of anthropological fieldwork. And that, uh, and not reckoning with that fact, uh, and if we insist in framing the questions that it's others who are, you know, 
It's other ex others' exigencies and others' requirements and other policy mandates that encroach upon our own practices. If we insist in framing things in, from that point of view, we, you know, that framing is all, it's a political framing. And we are shying away from confronting head-on crucial questions about how do we want to train uh, uh, our, our future anthropologists? Who do we need to train them in accompaniment with? We need the help of librarians, of archivists, uh, of data specialists. You know, these are all conversations and collaborations and alliances that we need to, you know, we, we, these are people we, we need to rethink the design of anthropology in the 21st century. Um, uh, how is it possible, and I'll finish with two questions, one of them a little bit polemical. How is it possible that almost 20 years from the Budapest Open Access Declaration, most anthropology journals are published on proprietary platforms, behind paywalls and under restrictive licensing and sharing terms? We, we know, I've already given you some examples, that both the infrastructure, both the licensing agreements, uh, uh, and l in let alone the financial requirements, are, you know, it's possible to imagine an anthropology beyond, you know, uh, um, uh, those terms of, of production. How is it possible, and this is my polemical question, that only this year the Royal Anthropological Institute signed a contract to have its archives, including the Malinowski archive, digitized and commercialized by Wiley for the next 12 years. The types of path dependencies that that is, got, that is going to generate on, on, on those archives are uh, so restrictive that you know, never ever again will those materials be in the open and public domain. So with that, I'll uh, turn to Kim. Good morning. It's um, a pleasure to be here and to talk about a topic that's become very central to my daily practice and at the core of my intellectual and political commitments. So what I want to talk to you about today is the many paths to open data. Over the course of my career as an academic, I've become increasingly invested in open data, and I want to share with you here why and how I've done that. Uh, in process, I hope to push back some against the, um, the reaction against uh, that often occurs in response to data re regulation, which is to kind of withdraw into a kind of d data conservatism that I think easily becomes a methodological conservatism that makes it very difficult for the field to address contemporary concerns. And we, of course, need to be creatively compliant with various laws, and I think we can learn to do that through a combination of technologies, governance structures, and practices. We also need to be involved in the shaping of laws, as many uh, scholarly societies in Europe have done in the last uh, year uh, with regard to the new data regulation here. But I think more importantly, as Alberto has stressed, we need to think about how the pressures today actually can stimulate new practices within the discipline that are good for our uh, discipline and practice. And there's many, many questions and pr things that we'll have to work out along the way. But I think the real promise is methodological, that in the pressure to um, to work with new uh, data, new data flows, new sharing practices. It has, it has the potential to really vitalize the discipline, uh, allow us to address uh, problems with, with a great deal of dimensionality, and, and create knowledge that is relevant to the societies in which we live and work. So, so my path to data started very early. My research career began at the site of the Bhopal disaster in India, the disaster the chemical leak was in 1984, and I was in the field in the early 90s. But one of the things I learned early that any d disaster is usually also a data disaster. And so one of the images you see here, the, um, the board up on your right, was the very crude data system used to locate, uh, 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 that people used to try and locate victims of the disaster. And this image has really haunted me throughout my career, calling upon me to ask, you know, what kind of data systems do we need to attend to the complex problems and vulnerabilities uh, of late industrialism? Importantly, one of the responses to the Bhopal disaster in the United States, probably the most formative, 
was data regulation that required companies to disclose the kind of risk that resulted in the Bhopal disaster. And importantly, that da those data requirements required electronically downloadable data. So it pushed environmental risk data into the public domain and allowed the kind of images you see in the middle here produced by activist groups to make it visible what the potential for these kinds of hazards are. And just a quick sense, the red circles on your left, each of those red circles is a chemical facility with the potential for a Bhopal-like catastrophe uh, along the Mississippi River between New Orleans and, and Baton Rouge. Uh, but later in my career, I, um, I became increasingly focused on the environmental health sciences. And there, too, data kind of jumped out in its significance, uh, in part because of the nasty politics around data, because of the corporate interest in, uh, in environmental uh, studies, but also because of the way building data infrastructure in the health sciences galvanized those fields and allowed them to make uh, to really, really be inventive methodologically. And so the way that scienti other scientific fields have used uh, data infrastructure to push themselves forward uh, ha has been part of my ethnographic experience that I've been brought back into my work building infrastructure within anthropology. And so within anthropology, another thing that's pushed me to open data is work in building infrastructure in our own field. In the mid 2000s, starting in 2006, I became a co-editor of Cultural Anthropology. At the time, I really didn't even know what ac open access was. I kept confusing it with open source, and I didn't know the difference. Um, so it was a very steep learning curve. But one thing we quickly learned is that if we use proprietary software to rebuild our, the back end of the journal where you keep your reviewers, it means that you can't keep that data when you move to a new publisher. And so very early on, we, we moved to OJS, which John was formative in, in developing for the back end of cultural anthropology, because we wanted to, own, you know, reviewers are one of many types of anthropological data. Um, 10 years later, af long after we were editors, cultural anthropology became open access. And so the, the extraordinary pushback that was involved in making that happen uh, was a great learning experience and made me aware of the role of our professional societies and our journals in just constituting the field of the field in which we do our scholarly production. I'll skip forward to now. Currently, I'm the president of the Society for Social Studies of Science, which is an interdisciplinary field of mostly qualitative social scientists. And I'm in a role there to um, steward the two journals that the, the society itself owns, but also to question the data infrastructure that field needs to lay ground for its work in future years. And so these questions, I'm circling back to, I have responsibilities for journals in a way uh, that I did a, about a decade ago, but a key question that I hope we can get to now is how all the work on open access journaling relates to and, and intersects with a work to build open data infrastructure. And in largely, it's run kind of side by side so, um, so far. Oh, one thing I'll point out is the center image, we've just set up a digital archive for the Society for Social Studies of Science, and it begs a lot of questions about um, ownerships and rights, technical questions about where the data physically should be, be and data handling, questions that we as a community, I think, we need to take on. Another um, organization I've been involved in is called the Research Data Alliance. And this is an organization that works to encourage research data sharing across different fields. Uh, a powerful lesson of that field, uh, of that experience, is that other fields, too, are struggling to figure out what data infrastructure they need to support and steward their fields going forward. In this organization, I co-chair an interest group called the Digital Practices in History and Ethnography Interest Group. And we sit alongside interest groups in biology, there's a whole wheat studies group uh, in chemistry and atmospheric science so that we can learn from their data practices. There's also groups of the sort you see up here, technologists with, with experience in metadata, provenance, uh, data rescue. 
And so there's, a, there's communities of practice that anthropologists uh, are just beginning to know that I think can help us in our data infrastructure efforts. And one of the ways that the Research Data Alliance works is to ask for working groups that, that come up with recommendations for what they sort of call best practices, but they don't want a sense that there has to be a standard solution to all groups. And so one of the projects we're involved in is developing uh, a process by which people in what we've called the empirical humanities, which would include anthropology, um, how they would develop the metadata standards that would make our data discoverable if we archived it. And as I'll get to in a moment, every time we've turned around trying to build data infrastructure, there's more questions that have to be asked. And so a real um, point I want to stress here is that the work of data infrastructure that we need to do as a community is not merely technical work. It's deeply conceptual work. I think we can draw on our understanding of the way le language works and meaning is made to make that in infrastructure appropriate for our practice. I'm now going to share just a little bit about the digital platform that I've been involved in developing that's, that's been a, it was designed to support collaborative ethnographic practice. As I'll describe, it's had to become a data management solution. And it's suggestive of the kind of solutions that we can use in our field. So the platform is called the Platform for Experimental Collaborative Ethnography. It's a, a highly customized, um, it's got a Drupal open source back end, but a highly customized data model on top of it. Uh, one of the things that makes it distinctive is that we built the ethnographic project first and built the digital infrastructure to support it, which is um, different than the way a lot of uh, infrastructure and, for example, the digital humanities have been built. Uh, importantly, we've worked very hard to take um, to inflect the, the platform theoretically to ask what kinds of assumptions about language, meaning, et cetera, need to be built into digital spaces to make them appropriate for ethnographic work. We've also built it in a way that respects the, um, the way that individual projects in anthropology are important in the field and yet can be nested within other fields. Uh, and also the allergy, the very healthy allergy I think anthropologists have to being overly structured, to not wanting to be kind of uh, developing a method appropriate for a study is part of what we do. And so we've, we've worked with the notion of light structure, so structures that allow us to collaborate without overdetermining how projects develop. Uh, the platform is designed around groups, and this allows for you to have projects within projects and projects that sit beside projects. Important for our discussion here is it's through the group architecture that you have the, the user controls that allow you to have data that is completely private within the system, restricted to a research group, or public. So user controls of the sort that Alberto described with Mukatu are also built into this structure. And this is critical because so often anthropologists are worried that if we're going to have open data, it all has to be open all the time. What, this, what we're trying to design is a project where we can store data, where you can modulate its accessibility as appropriate. You don't have to ever make it uh, private, but it's got a back end where you're, it's easy to make it private when that, that time is right. This is one project that's running on the ASMA file, so an instance of peace now, just to give you a sense of what it supports. We now have 11 research groups working in 11 cities on air pollution governance, and you can imagine the, um, chaos, the controlled chaos of trying to get the, um, to data share uh, across those groups. Five of them uh, are, in, five of the groups are in India. And interestingly, one of a key type of data we produce is the data other people produce about air pollution. And so the way that data sets themselves become ethnographic data and you know, cultural producers, so to speak. And so one of the things that we need to keep up with in our infrastructure is other pe people's data and how they make it legible. Data like this, which is the availability of Uber data becomes constitutive of uh, transportation politics in many of the cities that we study. This is what the repository looks like in our platform. You can add 
Um, and just to quickly, you can add audio, images, uh, PDFs, text, and importantly, what you putting something into this systems give it gives it the metadata so that it when it when you want it to be discoverable off the site, it can be. And this is what it looks like simply to upload a piece of data. And this, for example, is um, an art installation in China that was available online. Our, our work in China, the things disappeared very quickly. And so having a place to store data became uh, really important to the sustainability of the project. And this uh, I mentioned earlier, um, a key p part of the platform is um, well, we didn't build it to be a data management system. It had to become one. We built it to support our collaboration, but very fine-grained um, uh, user controls and accessibility things is key to its ethnographic functionality. And then the, one of these last slides, the, the platform's open source and available at, as a GitHub download. It still, it's still kind of wobbles and, and squeaks, but there's now many instances of it in use. You're welcome to um, join the party, so to speak. And through its use, we're trying to work out what data infrastructure for ethnographic practice and expressly experimental ethnographic practice looks like. This is in kind of brief what kind of the structure is. Uh, we really built it to support the middle part of this triptych, the kind of collaborative analysis. We've ended up having to build archiving infrastructure. And one of it's become a goal to make the system easily support compliance with data management plans as expected by funders like the National Science Foundation. And we're hoping to build it out as a community resource for people who want, need, want and need that kind of architecture. And this just get, gets at the, the infrastructural demands that Alberto pointed to. Um, this, I, this is an old slide that I've realized needs to be updated, but these five levels of um, storage, like physically, where is the data handled? Uh, like across the top are different functions of the platform and beginning to be listed at the bottom are the, the social relations we need to do that. For example, a persistent identifier that you would attach to a data object so that you could point to it in a citation. Where do you get those? Well, now that I've just moved to the University of California system, I can get those through my library. But all of this, this, this is what infrastructure build uh, looks like, is kind of many, many layers of functionality and many different kind of partners that anthropology, uh, we, as a field, we just haven't developed those partnerships yet. And so I'll just end with uh, stressing that for in the peace platform, one in building it, one of the most frustrating and um, exciting things has been it's really uh, begged a lot of methodological questions, like what is an anthropological workflow? Where is data made? Where does analysis happen? You know, data, we don't just collect data, we make data. On what basis do we make it? And so in trying to build the infrastructure, it actually um, mandates a kind of reflectivity that I think is really powerful for the field. It also slows you down because every time you want to go do something, there's a methodological question at hand. But the other thing that we've learned is that in order to, we want peace to work for our own research groups and the people that were around, but in order to, to sustain peace and other platforms in relation to Mukatu and Scalar, and there's many platforms out there, what kind of infrastructure do we need? So we've tried to start our envisioning a plan for what we've called research infrastructure for collaborative hermeneutics or RICH. And this, this begs a whole nother set of questions, which is, including you know, what kind of repositories do we need in the, in the field of anthropology and kin fields? Do we need a data net that would connect those repositories? Um, other fields like earth sciences, for example, has built that kind of capacity. What kinds of research designs, protocols, and governance structures uh, are needed to govern that kind of data net? What kind of metadata standards do they need to be standardized to make things discoverable? What kind of flexibility is possible? And so there's, um, there's probably 20 questions we've already identified that we need to ask in order to build that infrastructure. And what I'd like to ask you to do is to think about what it means to, to pull our community into collective deliberation and the making of that infrastructure. 
So I'll just uh, kind of end uh, a bit in jest, but really not saying that we need to get rich quick. We need this infrastructure. And I, and I, I say with seriousness that I think that in building this re infrastructure, we can really reallocate how value works and is produced in anthropology and in academia uh, writ large. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Beate Eland and I am working at the National Library of Sweden as an open access coordinator there. And um, uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about my background before I started uh, to work at the National Library of Sweden. I uh, am a PhD in ethnology uh, here at the Stockholm University and I also have experience as a senior research officer as, at the Research Council Formas here in Sweden. Uh, both uh, being a researcher or a PhD student and a senior research officer made me aware uh, about the importance of openness in research, um, not just within the academia, but also outside the academia, different stakeholder groups. And I think being an ethnologist, uh, being very close to the anthropologist, we know <laughs> what it it's like to work with real humans. We're not in the, like the hard sciences locked in a, in a laboratory or something. So we know also that research is about collaboration uh, and, and sharing experiences and knowledge. So that was my background when I started to work at the National Library of Sweden, which is a very interesting experience too, because a national library, um, especially the National Library of Sweden, a kind of have, a, have tasks or threefolded tasks. We are working or, or acting as a research infrastructure, but also as the, the the nation's archive or the nation's memory and also of course as a library and, and our, our stakeholder groups or our uh, partners are of course the research libraries, the high, uh, libraries at the higher education institutions but also the public libraries, the school libraries and the libraries at, at different agencies. So, Swedish ag agencies. So, we also know the importance and work every day with the importance of, of open access and, and to information for the whole nation. So, locking in information is what we need to work with to, to open it up. Um, and, and also, what working with so many stakeholder groups. Uh, we know, and I know both as an academia, uh, academic person, but also as a, as a policy kind of officer working at the National Library, uh, that openness is a prerequisite for collaboration. Uh, locking in information does not strengthen collaboration. Okay, um, so, uh, what is going on in Sweden when it comes to open access? Well, we have a very strong uh, national po political goal. The Swedish government strongly supports uh, open access uh, to research results, that is publications and, and research data. Uh, we have a, a national goal for uh, open access and research data uh, uh, to 2026. And we are also um, uh, seeing a stronger goal when it comes to publications, that is uh, 2020. So until 2020 or after 2020, everything that is published by Swedish researchers should be open access. Uh, so the, the Swedish government decided to assign um, coordination tasks to the National Library of Sweden and to the Swedish Research Council. So the Swedish Research Council is working with research data and we, the National Library, have the task to work with uh, publications. Of course, we strongly uh, collaborate here because uh, we have not mentioned the word open science, but open science is really about all uh, the whole research process and all research results. 
So uh, just to say a little bit about the, the, the work that is going on at the Swedish Research Council. Um, as you may know, uh, re there's no um, requirement yet at, at the research councils or at the, at the universities uh, to, um, to, uh, to make research data open. However, there are preparations going on for this. And we have a Swedish national data center collaborating with all uh, or most of the, of the um, higher education institutions in Sweden. We have a few universities that are, are presenting their own, own requirements or research data policies. Um, and the Swedish Research Council is working also with recommendations for, for research data management plans and, of course, a strong collaboration with the European Commission and the European Open Science Cloud. Having said that uh, about research data, I want to talk a little bit more about how the National Library is working with our coordination task regarding open access to publications. Well, we decided uh, immediately that coordination is coordinating uh, collaboration. So we have gathered um, uh, representatives from the main stakeholders groups here. So we are collaborating with researchers, with the funders, and with the higher education institutions. And we have formed uh, five working groups on identified issues or hinders to the, in the transition to open access. And um, the goal of these working groups is to present national recommendations on how to reach the goal of open access to publications. So let me just tell you a little bit about these five working groups, which all, which all uh, consist of representatives from, as I told you, researchers, funders, uh, the higher education institutions, and also the National Library of Sweden. We have two quite huge groups here uh, to start with. The first working group is looking into uh, how the uh, consisting merit and research allocation system, the reward and assessment system, uh, uh, system is not really supporting incentives for open access publishing. We know that uh, a researcher today, to a large extent, is va evaluated not only uh, or, or not so much about the, 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 the research itself, but where the research is published. So the, the journal impact factor and other um, and, uh, metrics uh, connected to the, the journal title is actually, uh, what, and we have done a study on this also, is really, um, shaping the whole assessment system. And we know that there is, and you know that too, that there's a large, huge um, ongoing critique when it comes to the existing uh, research uh, assessment and evaluation system. So we need to look into how this could be changed. Uh, and we are uh, collaborating closely to other, uh, with other countries. Uh, the Netherlands, for example, are working also with this. And we know that the European uh, Commission also has uh, this on their uh, uh, research political agenda. The second working group is about the how, to, to, how, to, how to implement a transition from a closed publication-based uh, um, uh, subscription-based publishing system to an open system, uh, uh, mainly with APCs, but of course also with so-called diamond open access, where, where the researcher or where, where, um, where APCs are not charged. So uh, maybe you know and heard about the cancelled uh, agreement with Elsevier. Uh, that was a decision uh, supported fr fr uh, from all the Swedish uh, vice chancellors. The vice chancellors in Sweden have decided that it's not uh, uh, correct uh, and it's not um, sustainable to continue to pay these large uh, amount of sums to uh, commercial publishers like Elsevier. They, uh, as you know, charge uh, two or maybe three times 
for the research that the researchers actually have given away to the publishers. So um, we are working um, also with agreements uh, and how to to uh, support the researcher in this huge transition period. Um, the third working group is about monographs. We want to have a holistic perspective on this, on this um, coordination uh, work. And we know that not everyone is publishing in, in international uh, journals. We know that, especially uh, within the humanities and social sciences, the book and the monograph is still an important channel to publish their work. So we also look into how to support the researcher if uh, also monographs uh, and books are to be published open access. The fourth group is about the national journals, smaller journals, not within these large publishing houses. We have uh, about 300 of them in Sweden, and they are often... Um, the editorial boards and, and the, the editors are often uh, researchers at Swedish universities or small societies, and they need quite a lot of support uh, to, to, to handle this flipping or the, the transition uh, process. So we are looking into uh, establishing a national platform, just like uh, in, they have in Finland, called journal.fe, and also in Denmark, uh, using the open journal system. Uh, so, so would, which would be an um, important platform for these national journals, uh, where, where researchers mainly publish in Swedish, uh, and, and within other disciplines than mainly the, the hard sciences. The fifth study is about open access data, to monitor this transition that we are going through. Uh, there are requirements, the funders, the main funders in Sweden have requirements to, to publish uh, the res research results, open access. And also the, the higher education institutions have recommendations. We know very little on how these requirements and recommendations are being fulfilled. So we need to monitor that. We need to monitor uh, the costs for open access as well as the cost for uh, subscription-based uh, publishing. So what we uh, all, um, the goal or the, the main um, knowledge here is that one size does not fit all. And that is why we have these five working groups. Uh, the transition or the transformation to an open access or open science system uh, cannot be made in the same way for all different disciplines. We have to acknowledge different traditions and different uh, um, ways to conduct research and also different ways in, in disseminating research. Uh, we also know that collaboration is crucial in this. Uh, not one single actor or stakeholder can go uh, or, or work with this tr uh, transformation. We have to do it together. And uh, it's, it's very important also to keep a balance between the, the, um, the top-down and the bottom-up initiatives. So we know that there is a lot going on within the research community, and we know also that there's a lot going on on the policy level. So it's really important to keep the balance between these uh, two approaches. Also, uh, open access has, to a large extent, mainly been a question for the research libraries. But we know that in order to support the researchers, when it comes to open science skills, or when it comes to uh, changing the reward system, the higher education, the universities, the, the faculties and institutions are very, very important here. Um, it cannot be made from the library itself. And the researcher should not be left alone in this. And I think the more we see uh, faculties or um, 
uh, own research groups, getting involved in this and getting to talk and, and having a, a conversation with the, and support from the whole university, then things can go on more smoothly than they are maybe are today. Open science uh, is part of the digitization, a digitization that is a revolutionary transformation of the whole society. We, ha we are seeing it in all parts of the society. And what open science is about, uh, science and digitization is also, as we have learned here today, affecting uh, the, the science and the research and the higher ed education system. But we, we need to have a dialogue on this and we need to, to share experiences so that no one is left alone in this huge transformation. No one has really done this before. We are kind of doing digitization for the first time. And I would say uh, anthropologists are actually the, the, the main discipline uh, that can understand, that know and have, the, have the, um, the tools to understand how societies are changing and transforming. And I, I, I would really like to see more of the anthropology of, of um, scholarly communication and digitization. I think there's a lot of knowledge to be gained from research on what is going on. And I'm speaking as an ethnologist uh, who really would like to do some more research on what is going on and to, to gain knowledge uh, about it. So, um, uh, if I just want to, if I should um, sum up here, I, I want to, to emphasize the need to, to, to do more research on what is going on and to critically um, examine and, and um, discuss not just the scholarly communication system as it is now, but how it ha has become like this. What happened? How did researchers end up giving away, giving away their research results to commercial publishers? How did that happen? Why is researchers being evaluated on where they publish instead of what they are publishing? And how is it that the, that the collaboration with stakeholders or reaching out outside academia is not a merit? What happened? Uh, research is about uh, reaching out and collaborating with the, whole, with, the, with the stakeholders and those who are in need of research. So um, I think I just sum up there and, and thank you for inviting me and looking forward to the, the further discussion. Thank you. Let me start by giving a little bit of a break. Um, this has been intense, uh, full of infrastructure, but let's look around us for a second. Uh, I don't know about you, but this is probably the most magnificent lecture hall I've ever spoken in. Um, and certainly the only lecture hall of this size that has a window out to a tree. Um, so that is to be appreciated, but also the desks that everybody has. And if you tried the two light settings, you can have dim and it's just a magnificent spot. Um, and this attention to an appreciation of infrastructure is, is what I want to speak to you about. Uh, I'm a Canadian. Um, I'm working in the United States right now, so I've kind of got the best and the worst of North America at this point in my political experiences. Um, I work in infrastructure and I want to explain that in a moment, but I want to do a little more appreciation, the GDPR. Um, I want to talk a little bit about that because in the United States where I'm working, um, it's kind of hit with a little bit of a what's going on and what's Europe all upset about and what are the issues here. Um, but I think it's clear in some ways that it, it is a come at a critical moment in terms of our transformation into data. That is, what are we becoming um, as citizens, as human beings, um, we are becoming increasingly a commercial commodity known as data. And the data stand that the GDPR has taken, the idea that you have a right to be forgotten, which is the most dramatic, but only one of the elements that it is instantiated, um, is worth considering. Uh, it's worth admiring and appreciating, and it's worth seeing the parallels with anthropology. 
So I am a professor of education. Let me locate myself a little bit here. I'm both outside and inside. Education depends a great deal and has learned so much from anthropology. We have an anthropology of education as kind of a sub-discipline. Ethnography is one of our favorite forms of research. Um, and to give you a bit more background on that, and I'll come back to GDPR, but let me indulge myself in terms of my own background and how I got into infrastructure. Um, so as a professor of education, ethnography in the classroom, we would sit in the back and we would listen to the wisdom of children. Our field was defined, in a sense, by the words of kids. Um, and they would tell us what they were learning and what they weren't learning. They would tell us what they thought of the world and how they had learned that outside of the school and some of it inside the school. Some from their parents and their communities, some from their countries and some from their travels. And the ethnography of education gave us an insight that the measures that were more typically done in educational psychology, for example, didn't give us. It was a listening to the voices of individuals. It was that sense of the identity and autonomy of the individual. And that aspect that ethnography brought to the fore, an individual within a community, within a culture, within a sense of belonging and context, but the individual voices. And at times I was even uncomfortable with how much weight we put on that, as if children were speaking to us with some kind of truth that we could not otherwise obtain, as if they were out of the mouths of babes comes this wisdom. And it was often a theoretical and kind of, uh, not fetishized, but taken perhaps too seriously. But at one point in my career, 20 years ago, um, I started to think about sharing things in terms of the internet. Start thinking about what does the internet mean as a change? This is the end of the 1990s. I don't know if you, actually some of you will have to ask your parents, I'm afraid, but um, the 1990s was a heady time for the internet. We believed that the information highway, as we foolishly called it, would be open and free. That everything would circulate, it would look terrible and be hard to read, but it would be open. Uh, and that was the principle of it. Public highways were like open to everyone. And that same principle was there. So in the 90s, that excitement was there. And as an educator, as a teacher, I thought this was perfect. That this would be a way that we could share. And in fact, I went to our local newspaper. This is in Vancouver in, in Canada. Uh, the Vancouver Sun. And I said, why don't we do a project together? Let's take advantage of this this new medium. Now, the newspaper was not online, but journals had started to move online at the end of the 90s. And this sense of history that Alberto provided a very good snapshot on, a snapshot on with regard uh, to the archive is something worth considering because I want you to think about anthropology within this history of the internet, within the history of the medium of transmission, of culture of what is becoming our humanity as a form of data. And so I went to the newspaper and I said, why don't we connect research and journalism? Now, I did have a little bit of an endowment to sponsor, that was sponsored by the newspaper, so I was able to get in the door. They, in a sense, paid my way in. And we decided to collaborate on sharing knowledge from a position of journalism on the street with their feet and research which we're also in the field, but we did a lot of our work in the back office and in, in the uh, university. Uh, and we did it on education and technology. And they went out and did the reporting and we did the, gathered all of the research that we could gather and we were gonna share this in a common forum. Newsprint coming to the door, online available links and, and all of that sort of thing. That, well, you couldn't click on your newspaper, but you could copy the, I don't, you don't remember this. We used to copy out URLs. We used to type in. When was the last time you typed a URL? Sorry. So that was our plan. And what happened was, I was stopped. The journalists were excited. They went out and worked in the libraries and in the schools. They quoted and cited young women and men in terms of computers and technology and all of that excitement. And my librarians told me, forgive me, that I couldn't share the research. In 1998, I could share the abstracts, but the research, and there was just a very small percentage of it online, but I was able to find on education and computers, 
a fair bit of it. And I wasn't allowed to share it. And I decided that there was something terribly wrong with this picture. And I decided that I had been naive in never having considered that the research that we did on behalf of everyone, every school child, every teacher, every parent, a little presumptive on my part, I like to think big about my own work, forgive me. All of that, I could not share, and it had never occurred to me. Now, in the age of print, when I grew up, it wasn't such a big issue. I'd never had an urge to get on a bus with a stack of journals and hand them out. But in the age of the internet, it just didn't make sense that publicly funded research in a public institution, which I was in at that time, but even a private institution, that is supported by endowments that get tax breaks, all of that should be part of the public domain. So part of my caution here is about the nature of infrastructure because what ended up happening for me is I very naively started a public knowledge project in 1998. I started a project that was gonna make knowledge public. No big deal, I only called it a project because like how hard can it be to make knowledge public? I'm a school teacher. This should be like a very easy thing to do. And I'm still working on it 20 years later. And the project continues in a way that is a caution and I hope a source of encouragement. We've seen a number of projects. The Peace Project, which is a lovely title. I can't say without thinking of the, the Peace Project. Um, and the, uh, Alberto's review of a whole series of projects. Uh, in terms of making things public. But what happened in my case, the cautionary aspect, is the public knowledge project has become all of my research. That I've become an outlier in my school of education. When people ask me what I do, uh, I have to say, first of all, I don't do education anymore because I'm just making knowledge, trying to make knowledge free to everybody and that's not education apparently. Because we don't have a discipline called knowledge dissemination. We have a psychology of education, anthropology of education, sociology of education, but we don't have a let's make the knowledge available to everybody so that they can teach themselves whatever they want to teach. And the work that I've done since then is to build infrastructure. The thing that we were missing, I realized in 1998, I didn't quite realize it in 1998, that's not that's too presumptive on my part. The thing I've learned over the last 20 years is that you cannot take it for granted that you will have the infrastructure to do what you want to do. That the projects that you've seen represented here are enormous areas of labor. I don't know the backstory for them, I know the backstory for the Public Knowledge Project. What we ended up doing was saying we need to build the pieces for others to do the work that we want them to do. No, no, they do the work that they want to do and that we want them to do. It's really what they want to do, but it's partly my agenda too. And so this idea of building infrastructure for others is a critical aspect of our work as academics. And in your thinking about the projects that you've seen presented today, what you need to think about is where you come in on that. There are so many different levels of participation. And in some ways, Kim and I represent an extreme in terms of our commitment. I've gone even further, I think, than Kim has. She's still doing anthropology. She's still very much involved in science, technology, and society. She's still working and doing her research in her original area. And I've changed my field. I'm now working in scholarly communication, a field that doesn't even exist. We do have a few journals but we don't have a field or a discipline. And so this idea of where your participation in the infrastructure world operates is up to each of you. And it's as simple as where you publish, no simpler than that. It begins with your relationship with your community, the community you're studying, your field of anthropology. It begins with recognizing that you have public responsibilities and GDPR does a lovely job, for me at least, of capturing that. Now, Kim mentioned that the scholarly societies in Europe were involved, and I think it's clear from the wording. I copied down a few of the phrases that there is this balance. At the center, the sensational center, is this right to be forgotten. 
This is the sanctity and the autonomy of the individual. And that's a critical element. Now, we think of that as an ethical principle, but it is very much a democratic principle that each person has a right. And that is the basis of democracy. So there is a political as well as a moral or ethical aspect. But on the other side, on so many pages of GDPR, there's a respect for the public interest. There is a respect for research. Let me just get some of this right. Historical research, scientific or historical research purposes. That's lovely kind of elimination of a whole bunch of fields. Just, the, just those of you working in history and sciences, you're totally okay. Some of us in between, following in between those two fields. But that's all right. This, this bureaucrats are writing this. They're trying to be careful, parsimonious with words. But this idea that this balance between individual rights and a concept of public interest is what anthropology has always, at least for me, in education, in the ethnographic area of the back of the classroom, has been about. That I have a responsibility to the individuals whom I'm studying, and my only warrant or right to be there in the back of the classroom and believe me, there were times when the teachers at the front were not comfortable with the researchers in the back. But my warrant for being there, for interrupting that community, was the public interest. There is something to be learned here. That's not enough. Curiosity is not enough. There's something to be learned that could contribute to the experience of these children and these teachers and parents and communities. And we need to think about that balance that we want to respect the rights of individuals, the consent that they have given, the terms under which they are participating in this research. And at the same time, we need to think about the public interest that provides the warrant for this work, this institution, this auditorium. And that public interest in this age of data is about evidence is about persuading people on the basis of what you have learned through anthropology. It's thinking about the impact of your work. Not the impact factor, but the way in which others can begin to use your work. So when we think about infrastructures, we want to think about, are these infrastructures working in a way that the communities whom we study or which we study, are able to use our work in ways that will serve them well. That one of the things about this data-driven society today is the notion of evidence-based policy. Evidence-based medicine was the origin of this. It's always struck me as kind of a weird, not oxymoronic, but like, what was medicine before evidence-based medicine? Evidence-based medicine is only three or four Decades, Canada has a very big part, played a very big part in its origins, if I can be a little bit nationalist for a moment. Evidence-based medicine is now the standard. Precision medicine is a further extension of that, evidence-based on the basis of individuals. Evidence-based policy is now the gold standard in terms of governments and governance, generally. And the role of your work and my work an evidence-based policy is going to be all about the infrastructure that makes our work available to communities, to politicians, to bureaucrats, to policymakers, to teachers, to parents. And this idea then of where you go with your work, where you deposit your data, where you publish your work, is not something that I would tell you how to do. I'm only asking you to consider this principle of is this work available? Can it participate in this evidence environment? Can it change the way in which we think about others? Because the major, the major aspect of this evidence environment that we live in, I'm just gonna see if that logo's up there. I, I wanna come back to, the, to this association's logo. The main aspect of this is the way in which we are measured. So what is becoming, in fact, uh, the phrase that comes to my mind is man is the measure of all things. This is Protagoras, a, a pre-Socratic sophist. 
And he sets, the, and man is the measure of all things with all of the gender bearing of that, actually became kind of a model for humanists and the humanities. But today, it's more like we are what we measure. And anthropology's participation in that is to transform the notion of we are what we measure into something more than just quantities, something more than just the standard measures, something more that is richer, as, that, as Kim's lovely acronym plays on, and something more than is being otherwise defined. So we consider, whether it's in the back of the classroom or wherever we work, what is being overlooked, what aspect of our humanity, our community, our culture, and we think about how that can become part of the evidence, part of the measure that is having such an effect in terms of how society is being governed and how people are being judged. So the infrastructure story then, at least for me, is this aspect of a decision of participation, of a decision about impact. Now to come back to the extreme that I represent, I wouldn't ask anyone else to drop your anthropology, as it were, um, and start working on building infrastructure. But what you need is an appreciation. What Kim presented with peace was a beautiful set of, of, of systems, software, coding, design, that enables anthropological data to be shared, communities to take advantage of it. Now, we do publish and make our work public but the idea that a community can, that you were providing a service to a community by collecting that data that they can use, that the indigenous peoples work and ideas and thoughts governed by knowledge protocols can become resources for those communities, seemed to me part of the potential of peace. But the way in which this infrastructure is shared needs to be considered. The way in which infrastructure today is part of a cash nexus, part of capitalism's hold on the academy has to be considered. So the area in which I work is scholarly publishing and the infrastructure that I build are publishing platforms. And we build them within the spirit of this new internet openness. We build them just as Kim built Peace on open source software. Now this is gonna be confusing but you wanna pick up a few terms before lunch. Open source software is not simply a communist plot. IBM and Tesla and others use it. Open source software means that it can be freely shared, but it can be freely contributed to. You can fork it, you can contribute to other people's work. And peace, what, what was pointed out by Kim, is it's available to download from a GitHub site where we put all of our open source software, albeit a commercial operation, and this idea of, of what kind of software is being used is a minor aspect, but it takes a lot to support it. And so the projects that support this need a little bit of no more than your respect, no more than your interest, no more than a question. Is this open source software? Google makes it confusing. They have open source software. Chrome has an open source base to it, but there's proprietary levels to it. So are you using Google Docs? Is that open source? No, but it's more open than Microsoft Word. And so you're thinking about the infrastructure. You're asking questions about the basis on which this infrastructure is being shared. Open source software is one term. We'll, we'll go for three or four, no more. Open access has been referred to repeatedly. Open access is the basis on which the knowledge, they publish knowledge. It's a narrow term. I would say free to read, but I didn't win on that debate. It's open access, it's, and open access is research and scholarship that's been published and peer reviewed, and this is going to become increasingly important as we see our work circulate publicly, as we see our work compete with the real and the fake news, as we see our work begin to figure in public debates, in newspaper articles, and this aspect of open access is another question in your mind. Is this open access? 
How is it licensed? And we could get into the Creative Commons licensing, but that's too technical. A third element is open educational resources. Open educational resources, should I do a review? Open source software, I'm a school teacher. Open access, open educational resources. Open educational resources, everything we publish is becoming an open educational resource. The poster child of open educational resources is the MOOC, the Massive Online Open Course. You want to think about your work as an educational resource. Can others use this to teach? Is my archive a source of educational inspiration for high school students, for the communities that I was studying or am studying? Is there the possibility that others can learn from this independently? Open educational resources. Why are these names important? Because as you circulate the name, it becomes a reality. As it becomes a label that others hold to, it takes on a substance. It becomes a social relation in Alberto's sense. So we have open, open access, open source software, and we have open educational resources. Finally, open data, the fourth of these. The open data, how am I going to participate in open data? The choices there have to do with a couple of elements of infrastructure. One is what we're seeing is a corporate takeover of academic infrastructure. The major, in fact, the re reference was made to uh, Bitten by the uh, Swedish government taking a stand against Elsevier. These major corporations like Elsevier, Taylor & Francis, Wiley, have been purchasing infrastructure. This is fine, it's part of their business model, but it has meant that the ownership of the infrastructure has become a question. The openness of the infrastructure has become a question. Openness, not just in the sense, is it accessible, but open to the community's participation, governance, direction, ownership. And so when you think about placing your data, when you think about your responsibilities of sharing your data, you might want to think about it in terms of the principles that sharing the data is part of the sharing of knowledge. You might want to think about it in the of politics, that sharing the data can enable a community to have a greater impact in terms of its own interests, politically, socially economically, and that sharing the data can support a sense of relationship between the institution of the university and the communities within which it operates. And that openness is an aspect of that. But then there's another smaller aspect of open data I want to introduce, and that is the notion of how data can be shared only insofar as it can be understood and interpreted. The setting the standards now, the strange part is we often look at medicine as the leader, but genomic research still doesn't have a single standard for the sharing of the genome. That one of the things that the National Institutes of Health in the United States are currently engaged in are setting those standards. It is not an easy thing. So one of the things I want to ask you to think about in going forward is not to build your entire infrastructure of data for data, no, no. Just to think about sharing your data in a way that sets certain standards is probably too harsh, but a way in which others can interpret it and use it. In a way in which there's some agreement among anthropologists for the standards of sharing. What is the data, how do I describe it? We call it the metadata. How is this data described? when it was gathered, who was involved, the nature of the community, the location, geospatial, all of those different elements. How can I see that my data is only as useful as it can be interpreted, integrated, aggregated, extended by others? So, in terms of this new age of data, I'm suggesting to you that there are both similarities, the GDPR has its parallels between the individual and the public responsibilities that anthropology has always been involved in all. And that it has opportunities for everyone to make, take a stand in terms of where they publish, what they do with their data, how they begin to respond in terms of understanding and introducing a vocabulary of openness, a concern about the academic community's relationship to the rest of the world and its own openness. And finally, to have some sympathy and 
provide some support for projects like Kim's in terms of inquiring about how you can participate, what would it take to begin to create your own instantiation of peace or rich or other acronyms I've now lost track of that Alberto reviewed. And the sense of opportunity then should be the driving aspect. The ethical and political challenges should be welcomed and it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Can you, is this working? Yeah. So uh, um, we've got about 20 minutes for uh, just to open up uh, questions or uh, publications. Anyone has doubts, anything? Question over there. Yeah. Thank you very much for your presentations. I've learned a lot. Uh, I really appreciate all the efforts made, made to teach us more about the possibilities of infrastructure, the opportunities that it offers us. I really appreciate that and I think that is important. However, I'm also worried. I'm also worried when I listen to you. And I'm worried because I think that on the one hand, all these projects are very important for us insofar as they fit with the particular projects we're working on. However, if you take into consideration that some of us also work on the kind of projects that are slightly different, then you may also want to think a little bit further, I think, in the ways in which these kinds of technologies actually, in what, kind, what, what are the effects for a particular kind of work that we are doing for the particular kind of work because I very much agree with the open access, I very much agree with the open educational sources and I very much agree with the providing of the platforms, etc. But what I worry about is the obligations that we are increasingly facing in the field of open data and open science because it sounds beautiful. It sounds beautiful open science and who can be against transparency? I can tell you I am against transparency in a lot of cases because I think they create serious problems for the work that we are doing. I've experienced that myself personally, the problems with that. And I think that there are two major, uh, that there, there are a few major issues. One of the major issues is how safe is this kind of technology? How safe is it to, for instance, the intrusion of security services? Uh, how can you defend researchers who have very sensitive data? What do you do with that? Because I heard, like, for instance, in your last presentation, it's all very nice that you want to share your work with the communities, and in a lot of cases, it will be very important. But it's not necessarily so. That is based on that you work with particular kinds of communities. What if you're working with very powerful people who actually, you know, you do not necessarily want to share everything with because what you share with them could be used against people in a weaker power position. How do you work when you work with people who are involved with, for instance, violent terrorism? Do you want to share all your data? I mean, there are some cases, I think, and I think they're in a sense, when you discuss them further, you will also see further that the ways in which also in our discipline it's very important. Sometimes, you know, I, I appreciate the idea of being compliant with the law, but the anthropologists work in very different societies. Anthropologists also work in very authoritarian societies. Saying that they always have to be compliant with the law, I think, is in itself problematic. And of course, there are many different ways in being compliant with the law. And I think that we should be also careful not to take that so much for granted. Anyone wants to ask that? Yeah. Well, I'll just say quickly that I, I think it's really clear that all data shouldn't be shared and we shouldn't expect it to be shared. And the judgment about that should rest with the community and the technology needs to support that. And so the heterogeneity, one real concern in building digital infrastructure is that it will impose um, standards of practice and concept, kind of methodological cookie cut, you know, and that would be horrific for the field. And so there's both the methodological standardization that's of concern and the expectation that all data is the same. And I think that 
I think that can be respected even while asking ourselves what would be the benefit of data sharing, and not out of simple transparency or a desire for reproducibility, but for to add hermeneutic dimensionality because you have multi, you know, layers of interpretation that are possible if the data is shared. So I don't, I mean, I, I think that you can be a, an advocate of open data and not be saying that all data is appropriate to share. So, uh, if I could just, uh, did you want? You go ahead. Okay. Um, I, I agree. The, the, yes, it's not about sharing everything. And that's why I tried to emphasize the impact on the community, thinking about it. But your comments uh, stirred in me another thought um, that I didn't address and, and that I'd like to put on the table. And that is, what if we thought about our work in terms of making it public? What if, what if we thought about what can we do in our studies that if it was made public, it would change, make, do some good, have an impact that we would be happy with. Um, because that's the difference. We didn't have to think about that before because our work was not going to be public in that way. And so at the beginning to think about the research as something that is intended, excuse me, to have a Im public impact uh, in a way that we think is valuable. And that doesn't mean that everything has to be driven by something very practical in terms of its achievement but it can be as something as large as changing something within the field of anthropology, a theoretical conceptualization of participatory uh, ethnography, for example. So this idea that, we, that something has changed uh, and that we need to see that not as something that we need to protect our work from, the bad side of, but that we need to reorient our work as a, as a public act. Looking at the um, open research data mandate within the Horizon 2020 and so on, and also for the forthcoming um, uh, Horizon Europe program, it says as open as possible and as close as necessary. So writing a research data management plan and also to declare what cannot be made open accessible when it comes to data. It's not even possible to make everything open accessible. Can I just very quickly add to that? Um, I mean, I think one of the questions I'm interested in is, in is when do we, you know, which questions do we ask first when it comes to data? And I think the ethics question uh, being very important, uh, actually it's, you know, bringing the ethics question as the primary question to relate to data as a, as a problem. Uh, what do we share, what we don't share, et cetera. It's, um, uh, it's a way of framing uh, a, a political way of framing what our relationship with the data is. And I think for me it's more important for the question, first question to ask about data, not what the ethics of the data is, how do we share it, et cetera, but what the infrastructure underlying the data is. So for instance, uh, I was just wondering how many people here are taking notes on a notepad versus how many people are taking notes on an iPad or an iPhone or a, uh, or a computer. Um, our, if our I, you know, most of the students I'm sending out to the field today uh, they don't go out to the field with notepads. They go to the field using Evernote or Google Keep uh, or Mendeley as uh, note-taking devices. The very gesture of attending a ritual or an interview or an observation, the very gesture of taking a note on Evernote, it's already a coded data practice. That, that information is already data and is data in a proprietary infrastructure. Right? So if we, don't, if, we, if we do not even teach our students you know, that, you know, that the conditions of anthropological record keeping are changing, right? And we, th and, and it's, and we, and we, and, and what we are transmitting to them is that the ethical problem comes later. No, the ethical problems comes in the very gesture of inscription today, you know, as an infrastructural gesture. I think that's one of the questions I, you know, I think one of the issues I think is, is worth bringing to the fore. There was another question about that. Um, thank you very much. I think this has been a wonderfully balanced round table in terms of the different tones of voices that we've heard, um, cautionary and positive, and giving us examples. Um, I appreciated the point about infrastructure, and I would like to, to get back to that, but to a different kind of infrastructure, and that is to universities. And we've already heard about the impact of research assessment exercises on where we publish and what we publish, um, which is research assessment exercises uh, take place within national frameworks um, and 
turn into games that are placed by by, played by universities and then their university strategies of how to enable research and what to support and in what direction to push researchers when they're, for example, submitting bits, etc. So in the case of the UK, the Economic and Social Research Council requires that all projects funded by it submit their data to the UK Data Archive. And there's the problem that we heard in Kim's presentation very nicely that ideally what you really want is that the platform you use to share data to be specific to the project, to be, to be really um, in tune with both the, the research team, the way that these collaborators are working together, where they are, but also the data that is collected, the topic that is explored, and the methodologies that are being used. And that's, of course, something that you do not have with the UK Data Archive, and that you don't have when universities are taking really clear stances on, right, you might tell me that you can't put your field notes into the UK Data Archive, but we're not going to put you forward for this grant or for this competition if you don't comply with what we want. Um, and there are sometimes ways around that different universities have different levels of flexibility, but you know, what happened at our university with data management plans was the moment that the ESRC insisted that these are being attached to any kind of proposal, that they funded two new posts for people who are data managers, who are now sitting at the top level of the university, who look after all the different academic disciplines and are telling us that we need to write technical plans for AHRC applications that don't require technical plans because we're not going to create some kind of big online kind of uh, thing in our project at least. Um, but the other side of that is that it takes us back, I think it all turns, I keep coming back to the question of what kind of data are we then talking about in terms of what goes into the, these archives and the online platforms. And it seems to me that really we're talking about data that has already been polished to a certain degree, probably preliminarily analyzed to a certain degree, because I think there's lots of stuff that, you know, I wouldn't put into an archive, not like that, you know, it's got to be kind of presentable and readable to somebody else, not everything that I do as an ethnographer is going to be appropriate for archival use. So that's the two kinds of things I wanted to throw into the conversation, the question of what kind of data are we talking about, but also these bigger infrastructures we work in of faculties and universities um, and the governance of research nationally. A really nice set of points, and I'll just uh, reiterate something I mentioned briefly that is in actually trying to build supporting infrastructure. The way it's made us ask what we actually do in practice and has been quite interesting. And one of the things that we've learned is Anthropologists, as anthropologists, we generate questions at many, many stages of our research process because you, I'll just give you an example. We collect a bunch of data visualizations that people use to understand air pollution. Let's say we have a pile of 30 of them. Like, what do we do with them? Well, you go in and ask, like, who made them? Where are they circulating? What do they mean to people? But that set of, like, micro-analytic structures, that too is data. And so thinking of not just the data artifacts, you know, a collected interview, the image itself, but the analytic rubrics we bring to it as data too. And then, okay, how do you attribute those? You, you know, we can learn to cite an interview, but how do you cite an analytic structure? One thing we've learned is, I've learned is that a lot of people don't want to share things like their interview questions. Even though many people develop interview questions and don't really follow them because no good ethnographer would, and we all know that, but actually crafting them is a good way to get ready for the interview even if you don't use them. But you could archive those with contextual data saying I actually didn't look down at my list of questions the whole time during the interview. But that too is data. And the incredible possessiveness people have about things like a set of interview questions, like there's no private data in that. I think there's a really deep property imaginary in our research practice that produces that affect, like it's kind of mine. 
But so I think there's a lot that we could share and archive for, for, for reconsideration. That's what will make us kind of better as a research community. That's not, some of it's about personal data, but certainly not all of it. And uh, I think we can take one last question. No. no. Oh, yeah. right. So uh, if, if we, perhaps if, um, if, we, if you get to ask the questions together, because we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, maybe we can discuss these issues more afterwards or next year, because <laughs> we don't have so much time. But I just want to raise uh, quickly two questions. Um, um, I arrived in the end uh, while John was speaking, and uh, he raised a very important issue from an anthropological perspective, which is access to our research of the people we work with or, or that we study. And I think the issue here is not only open access, you know, uh, the issue here is broader, and this is why we may have to talk about it uh, in another uh, context. Um, because the issue of uh, uh, the ranking of journals and the fact that we have to publish basically in English or American journals to uh, have a proper career uh, or have a career altogether uh, means that, for instance, if we work in Brazil or even in Italy, in countries where you know people do not speak English, then uh, these people will not have access or will not have an easy access to uh, our research. Um, and so, again, maybe this is a collateral uh, topic, uh, but I think it's uh, strictly related to the question of access of the people we are studying or working with. And uh, uh, the second um, thing is uh, talking about the new regulation of data protection in Europe. Um, I'm the PI on, on a European um, research project funded by the ERC, and this has been uh, has had a, an immediate effect on my project. Uh, so I think that these kind of regulations we should kind of reflect upon how they impact not only on uh, how we can share uh, our research fund findings, but how we can do our research in practice can or can't. Uh, a quick example, I've had to uh, modify my, the information sheets that we are using that are already complicated enough and difficult to use uh, doing field work, add extra information that is quite complicated to understand even for me, uh, and uh, you have to negotiate language, etc. but you have always to include some kind of legal terms that are very difficult to understand. Um, so I think that this is another important effect that these regulations have, and we should maybe dedicate a proper discussion uh, to this topic because they may make uh, difficult or impossible research, particularly on some uh, sensitive uh, topics. Thank you. All right. Yeah. My question, uh, I have many, but I just want to highlight the thing about language as well, because most of us probably uh, have data that is not in English and interviews or field notes or whatever. And in some cases, actually, some of us, like me, my field notes are in a very weird mix of Portuguese and English in, that uh, I would think are not easily, easily uh, archived or uh, publicized. They might be archived, but they will be a weird thing. So I think uh, taking taking language in consideration and not taking English as the, as the measure of all languages uh, is something that uh, we have to think about if we want to take this seriously. But what I really want to think or talk about is about uh, what as uh, that lady said on the obligations, because I'm a PhD student at the UK when the GDPR deadline happened, pretty much everyone panicked in the sense that are, is my research GDPR compliant? I have absolutely no idea whatsoever. Um, the university doesn't tell me. My, of course, my PI doesn't know. No one, no one really knows. And I am expected now to read GDPR and to figure out whether or how can I make my research a GDPR uh, compliant, and part of that, for instance, is finding out that my university has a repository that I can put my terabytes of data because 
Some of us have terabytes of films or interviews or images uh, that right now are in a cupboard in a SSD in my house, but uh, I'm only allowed to do that if I'm, a, if I'm within a project within the university. And anthropology is mostly, at least at PhD level, an individual kind of thing. I'm not really assigned to any project. So there are some things with obligations and things that people are expected to follow, but there's no actual institutional support for people to follow that. So that's my provocation, I guess. Okay, I'm, I'm afraid, um, I don't think we're gonna have time because there's another session opening uh, at one. Um, so I'll just, uh, by way of um, you know, closing remarks, I'll just I'll say that actually all these very, very good and very critical questions um, from the floor and that we've heard today, I think one of the things they do highlight is that our anthropology is how, are very good at thinking with and through data. And they've been, uh, they really have been, I would say, uh, even if not, um, on the, as, you know, on the whole as a discipline, but they, they, some anthropologists have been very good, they have been at the, at the forefront of exploring the, you know, the digital in, uh, infrastructural uh, transformation in the, in, in, in the social sciences. And I think uh, I would argue that um, uh, it's really important for us as a discipline to foreground this image uh, rather than a defensive image of, you know, uh, this is, you know, the kind of data that is being data compliant and data managers that are being imposed on us are not good for us. I'd rather, I think it's important to foreground the other image because it's only by showing that we are data experts that we are gonna be recognized in future uh, data uh, policy uh, initiatives. So when uh, John noted that the GDPR, the GDPR effort listened to the voices of uh, social scientists and, and of course the voices of IT giants like Google and Facebook, etc. But actually it didn't listen, it did not listen to the voices of anthropologists because we are not recognized as data experts. So I think one of the important things is that we are data experts. We, you know, we've pretty much been at the vanguard of, you know, uh, 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 some people have been at the vanguard of that. And I think it's, it's crucial to foreground that image uh, rather than sort of a protective epistemological quirkiness of, you know, we do these things different, we need a special sort of, you know, protective clause, etc. But uh, and on that note, I do think we have to leave. <laughs>